Hunter, do you have a day job outside of filmmaking? I actually do not have a day job and it's taken me a while to get to this point where I think for the last two and a half, three years I've not had a day job but I think about day jobs sometimes. I definitely have those moments where I'm like, well maybe I'll go back and dip in and take some easy cash for a little while but uh, no, at this point I don't. At what uh, moments do you entertain that idea? Uh, it depends. I mean it's definitely moments of frustration when you know, you, you work very hard to raise a bunch of money for Walter, for example, and uh, you know, we, w we did a crowdfunding campaign, we raised $25,000 and, and we spent it all very fast. You know, it's basically accounted for, but it was sort of our strategy with how we're gonna release this film. And once you put that money back out there into the system, uh, you definitely have these moments where you're like, gosh, it's just too easy to spend this money. And you know, we're, we're you know, looking at how long it'll take for the money to start coming back. It's a calculated sort of gamble that, that, that we face, but you have these moments where you go through the process and you see what the industry is really like and you see how much competition is out there and how much content is out there. And you're like, hmm, is it really worth all this energy <laughs> that we're, not only that we're contributing, but now that others through crowd, you know, crowdfunding and, and you know, our fan base is supporting to really you know, keep, keep after it you know, for what, what you get in return. So you, know, you have those moments that just creep up on you and then something, inevitably happens where you calm down and you know you something something comes your way and all of a sudden you're like gosh you, you sit down a lot of times it's sitting down and seeing an audience watch your film and feeling it really have the effect that it's supposed to or you get this wonderful email or a conversation that you have with somebody that sort of turns you back around and makes you realize it's like this is for whatever reason this is what I was put on this this earth to do and I got to keep making these films so you have now five films under your belt. Mm -hmm. um, at what point of those five films were you able to walk away from a day job? So I have five films I've directed and um, there's been another one I produced with Mike Dion called Reveal the Path. And it was about the time that um, Mike and I came together on Ride the Divide that I was, I was actually thinking I was done for sure. And I was working a day job and or I was uh, getting ready to work a day job. I was kind of shifting things up, and so I, I shot this film with Mike, uh, Ride the Divide, and I was like, okay, this will maybe be my last hoorah. You know, get out there. This was number three. Number two was a total bomb, and I was like, I'll go shoot this, enjoy this moment, and then go work, and, you know, work the agency life and, and see where it takes me. But I remember stepping into that agency life and I kind of put one foot in and kept one foot out and I was like, I really don't want to work full time. So I set up a nice little structure where I was essentially working full time, but I was contract position. Um, and it, it, it was still that time though where I, th I figured, you know, this is probably going to be the way it goes. But over time, as Ride the Divide came out and was released, y you know, we saw quite a bit of success with that film. And um, that was about the time where I think I felt that you know, I gotta just get out there again and, and give it another go. Um, that was probably, it really wasn't until we saw that film uh, take off that I had that feeling that I could, I could do this full time. But I realized that if I do it full time, I have to do it full time and more than full time. You know, we're, we're, we're filmmakers, we're working every hour we can trying to, to get this, this uh, content made looking good and then ultimately distributed and, and, and marketed. So, you know, you still have to check in every once in a while and go, okay, I'm breathing. There's actual money coming in from the titles that I made in the past. You know, we're figuring out a system to do this, but it's, it's not easy. It's not easy money, that's for sure. And uh, it's usually just enough to kind of get by and you're kind of finding all the ways you can to, to continue shortcutting. So, fortunately, it took that one, one title that Ride the Divide that kind of gave gave us, you know, gave me enough sort of um, confidence in myself, but also, you know, a little bit of cash flow. Um, and then, and then, you know, being smart about my next few titles and not overspending and finding ways to make sure they get to market and that they, you know, also continue to give a little bit of revenue stream to, to our, to my approach. Yeah, I find cash flow is like Instant confidence. Yeah, so. it, it's true. <laughs> Cash is confidence. It really is. I sadly, have to say it. Yeah, sadly, no, it, it, but. So, what would you advise to another filmmaker who has probably lived that forty-hour-a-week life as most of us have at one time, and training themselves? I know we talked about it briefly mm -hmm. because it seems like it 
if I remember correctly from some videos I watched, you were close to going back before you did Walter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's you have to keep questioning, you know, why you're doing this. Is it worth it? Is um, is the, are the sacrifices you make? Um, unfortunately, the the corporate world that you see around you, that so many of your friends are are uh, investing in, you know, and getting return for, you know, is 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 tempting at times just because you see people living this life where they get things and they buy things and they consume you know but that's not necessarily the right lifestyle for everybody that's certainly not going to guarantee happiness it's not going to you know fulfill you if you're somebody who needs to be creative and needs to tell stories and and has these thoughts that you feel are important for the time and that's and if you if you ignore those, if you're one of those people and you're ignoring that, and you ultimately you know dip into that corporate system, you know it's you know it's not necessarily going to uh, to uh, deliver that happiness. So I think I got off track. I'm I'm, I'm uh, you know trying to trying to remember the exact question, but ultimately. Oh um, no, no, and I think that's though it's a great point yeah. that you did talk about because maybe yeah. people do need to kind of be able to buy what they need to buy, and yeah. then realize like okay, I'm kind of bored now. This is not, I don't know if I want to turn my life over for this many hours yeah. just so I can buy stuff. Yeah. But uh, I think the initial question I had was, oh, how would you change, or how would you train someone, or not train them, but advise them from making that shift? Because it's one mm -hmm. thing to mm -hmm. like say, oh, I'm going to cut back, I'm going to cut out cable, I'm going to not go to Starbucks mm -hmm. and things like that. But there's some drastic mindset changes I think you have to make, right? Yeah. To, it's, it's not just going without the morning latte. I think mm -hmm. you have to yeah. trust in things. Yeah, for sure. I think if you really want to make films, y you have to realize that you're going to give a lot to that and you're going to put a, a ton of time and probably have to cut a lot of things out of your life. And at some point, um, you'll get lucky and at some point, you know, you'll work hard enough that the, the return will, will start to come. For me, it's a matter of, I look at film as a long-term investment. I think most people look at it as a short-term investment. It's not your first project. It shouldn't, you know, you're not likely to have that one-hit wonder and take off and totally uh, have this career that's set. That's extremely unlikely. And, it, and it's something that we should be all dreaming about, dreaming about, and it will happen to a few, but for, for most of us, it's going to be something that we really need to take a lot of time with and find a way to have a lifestyle that allows you to keep producing films. For some people that is the, the day job and for me it was at times and I never discount it. It may be again, there may be a point where I say I need to go back and, and work a, a day job for a little while and just have that experience and let my, my mind rest from having to always you know, compensate and make it happen. Has it gotten easier for you from the third to the fourth, I mean in terms of trusting in that process because I think so many people have that mindset where, oh, it's going to be this one and that's all I'm going to mm. need and then I can just, you know, wave goodbye or some other gesture to my old life. Mm. Um, but has it gotten easier or is it still scary because now you know the realities of it? You know, it definitely gets a little easier going from film to film, but what gets, uh, you know, more worrisome in this, in this time is like, the market changes like you feel it happening like there was a time early on when I was releasing films digitally and getting great attention for that as, as you've seen with YouTube and, and the amount of views that 10 miles per hour got I mean it was the first feature length documentary on YouTube and so when I took those risks like it was awesome because people were like wow check this out I got so much attention nowadays it's harder to get that attention because there's so many other like films like and 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 filmmakers that are sort of like you know propping up and 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 trying different things and and getting sort of uh, a little more riskier in their approach it's kind of but that's fun too because it's like this anything goes moment you know in in the film in the film world but so I enjoy that I embrace it but I do get to that point where I don't know if what I did last film is going to work again this film you know even when it comes to like raising money before film like I've traditionally gone to sponsors and found um, you know corporate sponsors or nonprofit sponsors to come on board and get excited about a film concept and help essentially fund that film and that takes the edge off of me quite a bit because then I don't have to worry about either dipping into my own own money or using too much of my you know sweat time to like go out and totally shoot shoot a film and make a film so um, those old tricks they don't always stick around you know in this day and age when films changing so fast 
So you're reinventing the wheel, it sounds like every, every each time you go out and do that, you're yeah. trying something. You do have to reinvent the wheel, and, and something I'm realizing is you, um, each film that I make tends to go to a different sort of audience, and I like that. I like that creative ability to, to change my, uh, my approach on these stories. I don't want to necessarily just make cycling films. I don't want to get branded as that, that guy. And so, but I love making those films, and I've worked with Mike on those before. Um, but when you, you make a new film, like now we made a film about the world's oldest people, and it's like, okay, who are we going to market this to? You know, some of the same lessons and things we know from the past don't necessarily apply to this new sort of genre and this approach that, that uh, we have to face. So that's, that's the tricky part. And while that's fun and challenging, it, it's, it can be a little daunting too. If someone said, hey, Hunter, can I take you out for coffee or, or dinner? And I'm about to leave my day job. I, can you just, can you talk me through it? Because I'm really scared. I have this good gig, but I'm not fulfilled. And I've got insurance. And, and I, I really, I've got some money set aside. They take you to a nice place. You sit down. What would you tell them? I would say, leave your day job if you're thinking about it. Because there's more day jobs to come. And unless we all crash, which we'll all do it together, there's going to continue to be jobs as far as I'm concerned. If you're self, a self-thinker, a motivator, you know, somebody who's motivated and can make stuff happen, then uh, take your chance to leave your day job. I think we'll all ultimately maybe know when to go back. Um, I hope. I, I say that too and I caution, I, I throw a little caution out there because I have had that moment back in 2008 when everything was crashing and I was kind of in that, I don't know, films for me and I started looking a little bit at jobs and, and it's, it was tough, you know, it was definitely that tough feeling of like, I don't know if I can get a job anymore. Like it's, it's I don't know if I can be that sort of like, here's my resume and here's all the things I've done sort of person, you know. Um, and so uh, I do, I, I would say, just be careful what I say if you do sit down with me, but uh, uh, seriously, go for it. I mean, you take, take these chances. This is our time in life to get to take chances and do cool things. And you watch 10 miles per hour and that's my principle. And, you know, I've met a lot of people along the way that have seen that film and it's helped ultimately, I think, affect their decision to, to quit and go for something else. So what type of checklist should someone make? What is like they're almost they're packing for a camping trip. If they're going to leave a day job, let's suppose they realize, okay, there are many other jobs to come in my lifetime, but I may not have the time and energy that I do now mm. at this age, so I'm going to do it. What would you tell them? What are some of the actual, like, you know, uh, whether have this much amount of rent or mortgage in the bank or, you know, I mean, like real concrete mm -hmm. steps. Yeah, I think if you want to leave your job, uh, to try something new. I think you definitely should try to have some savings set set aside and you know And that would depend on if you've got a mortgage or, or, or those types of things I'd be afraid not to I mean I would I would say that you should kind of evaluate what you really need what you have to have and, and be okay with potentially separating yourself from some of the things that you're you're you know sort of hooked on um, I've often found when you make those changes in life it brings you know so much so much reward to you um, and then have a plan you know give yourself a time time frame for do, developing what you want to do if it's a film great I mean don't think that you can go out and make a film in a few months it's gonna take typically a year to two years at least for your first film to really develop it shoot it and and, and get it finished for some people it takes a lot longer I, th I think it's very important to put pressure on yourself and those that you're working with like I try not to put I try not to allow more than two years to span for the whole lapse of development and, you know, production and post-production and ultimately distribution, you know. I mean, distribution kind of goes on, but the main core initial phase of distribution is, you know, usually a few to several months. So my goal, you know, ultimately with films is, you know, definitely give yourself a limit and that's with any, any project. And if you get out there and you quit your job and you've done this and you, you, it's not working for you, don't be afraid to go back and and work again at a day job for a little while and rethink, you know, reinvent. I think that too many times we get too scared about, oh no, what's going to happen? And really, well, I'll be fine. You know, you might be in a little bit of financial duress for a while, but who cares? You can, you can use your experiences that you found by, by quitting your job and trying something different to ultimately find a better job that pays better and you can pay things off quickly. I mean, I was, at, I was, in debt about forty thousand dollars after my first film and and ten miles per hour and I remember when we were releasing it you know we we're making back a little bit of that money but then we were trying to make another film and 
we were trying to we were trying to get out of this hole and i was definitely stuck in a hole of lots of debt and for me that felt like a lot of debt at that time um it was on credit cards and i can remember when you know we were able to use use this like kind of scheme to prevent the interest from hitting and then the interest started hitting both josh and i were like man what are we going to do you know and that's that was a time when i was like okay time to get a job for a while and i went back got a job and i just worked very hard to pay those those credit cards off that was my top priority i, I wanted to as fast as i could get out of that debt it took a, took a couple years but i was able to do it um and and that gave me a lot of uh, life again but there was a period of time where it was dark it was hard it was like i can't make these films this is a this is a joke well fortunately some like 10 miles per hour you know had a few deals and and some some money did come in and we were able to use the money that was coming in to help you know to help get rid of that debt a little quicker um that's not the case for everybody i know sometimes your films just don't don't seem to to hit or take off so going from having a boss to being your own boss, how do you keep yourself on track? Because I would imagine it's so easy to get sidetracked mm -hmm. from you're used to punching in or being at a job mm -hmm. and then you're your own boss and this is ultimately up to you. How do you be your own taskmaster, so to speak? Like keep yourself on track and not yeah. you know, check Facebook every 10 minutes or? Yeah, keeping myself on track is definitely one of the challenges when I work for myself, you know. Um, partly because when you're working on a variety of films, you have films that are in release, so you're trying to promote those, then you want to develop new ideas, and then you also sometimes need to edit a film. You've got all these different things going on in any given moment, because you, you know, you've got multiple titles, and you're like, sometimes it's easy to shut down or get overwhelmed. So I just have one of those minds that puts pressure on myself and those around me. Like, you know, sometimes I... I worry about my wife who I work with on films now because I'm constantly basically getting up in the mornings and just a lot of times they're mental but I'm putting together these lists of trying to make sure each day I'm you know checking things off those lists sometimes they're you know in spreadsheets and a little bit more like planned out um, but it's it's very important for me to make sure that like every day I've got I'm making some kind of progress you know when I get a chance to travel and I'm in a place uh, like LA or New York I'm trying to set up as many meetings as I can um, because you never know when a meeting might lead to an opportunity or um, might, might uh, you know, might give you some new ideas or give you some opportunities. So um, I definitely have to put a lot of pressure though on myself because it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's not like having a job where you, you know, you walk in and you've got your day-to-day -day tasks and then you can kind of leave and, and go home. So at the same time, I'm also trying to figure out how to make sure I'm not over you know, overdoing things or wasting a lot of time on stuff that's not going to really pan out. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at what I'm doing and, and constantly reevaluating re and, and thinking about past projects and going, well, did that, did that really work? Um, I found that if I set up bigger sort of periods of time that are dedicated to one type of thing that I'm more, more effective. So for example, um, Walter was, essentially done an edit ready for release and we were trying to figure out exactly how we were going to roll out Walter and I was sitting around feeling like I was not being very efficient because it was over the summer I wasn't sure you know when exactly we we're going to release and so um, we sat down with our team and said okay let's make a plan on when we're releasing but let's also design a Kickstarter campaign crowdfunding campaign that'll help make that release happen and really put our energy into that that crowdfunding campaign and so I remember that period of time where I felt inefficient. I felt like I really wasn't progressing. And, and it, once we sort of had a really good solid plan that would take over the next few months of our life and time, then it's like the ball started rolling. Other meetings started coming. New, you know, new projects came in. There, there was like a certain sort of energy that, was, um, that, that, that came about. And of course it helped that our Kickstarter campaign was successful. Um, takes a lot of work, but that was ultimately, you know, a good example of how productivity was back in place. And, you know, after this phase, we've got another month or so of this phase, we'll get into sort of the, you know, holiday time, it'll slow down a little bit. And so we'll see, you know, we'll see sort of what the next plan, maybe that'll be more of a development time where we write, write out some ideas and really focus on, on some things like that. But I like to kind of section off these little periods of, of the year or, or whatever to really focus on one aspect of a project. Speaking of energy, you were saying that um, in some sense things have gotten a little bit easier and that now you have a tremendous body of work and then some 
deals or potential mm -hmm. things have come from it and people mm -hmm. are interested. Can you touch on that? So yeah, and one of the, the exciting things about right now is as I've distributed, made and distributed multiple films back to back, I'm finally starting to feel that sense of like a long-term investment that's really, you know, paying off. Um, not just in terms of money, because it's, it's not paying off with a lot of money, but it's paying off with just enough money to sustain. But what, where it's starting to really pay off is that I think people are seeing that I get films made and I get them out and do relatively well with distribution. And so people have started to, to knock on my door, which is sort of a new, you know, a new, a new thing. And it's pretty exciting. I've had, you know, out, um, I've had, you know, one guy that's been emailing me multiple times and calling me like persistently to, to try to get a meeting. Uh, I've had uh, somebody reach out to me who saw Ride the Divide, um, an LA, uh, uh, an LA TV director who has a concept for a TV series, and he's uh, you know he's got legit connections and contacts and and some great actors um, that he's he's worked with and also got committed to be part of the series and it's a cycling series ultimately so he's interested in sort of fusing a documentary style with um, sort of his narrative approach and the you know the old narrative approach to making a TV deal so it's kind of a, a cool period of time where it's like I can sense things are shifting you know I can sense that there's you know it's one of those deals where it hasn't quite fully opened up yet but it's nice to 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 feel that you know if you really stay committed and you make films and you're really focused on on something that eventually you will get um, people seeking you out you know and and, and talking to you and, and I mean in the instance of this um, potential TV series I know it's it's like all my other projects and all my other things. I don't get too excited because a lot of things, a lot of these things, don't pan out, and that's something you you, you sort of learn to to uh, to do over the years. Is you just you can't get overly excited. You have to take you know take everything with a grain of salt and take your time on it and make sure you have multiple ideas you know in the hopper. And if something's failing and not working, get rid of it, move on. You know, and I think um, I think when you can kind of figure out that right sort of um, sort of assortment of things and, and energy and and people start knocking on your doors that's that's ideally when you know when you can kind of say okay I've done all this for a reason you know like it's actually gonna potentially pay off so I'm not trying to hopefully I'm not jinxing myself right now <laughs> but I do feel like you know we're I'm kind of at that turning point in the career where some things are gonna happen in fact I think I watched one of your um, interviews where someone said 12 years overnight success I'm like shoot I'm at almost 10 years now so that means I've got two more years and and I'll, uh, I'll get to be the overnight success. So I'm waiting, waiting for that day. I, it's funny because I remember in the past it used to be like seven years or something, and like now all of a sudden it's 12 years, but whatever, I guess we're here. What do you think that other filmmakers, what would you recommend to them that they can do to set themselves up so that they can prove to the right people that they can have confidence, not in just their work, but also them showing up, yeah. staying with the project, doing what they say they're going to do on time? Because isn't that so much of what it is? They're lo they're looking for people not just who are incredibly talented, but also that are going to be reliable. Or maybe I'm wrong. Is that? Yeah. No. I think I think you learn as you go, like what kind of people are reliable, and you can sense that pretty quick if you've got somebody who will will help you and work with you and collaborate. And in a lot of cases, like I can't pay people what I probably should be able to pay people, but I do everything I can to give them back end on my films. And I talk with them and I say, Look, listen, this is my approach. I'm very transparent. I'm doing everything I can to raise the money up front, not to have a lot of debt or investment oftentimes on these films, so that when we get to market on a film, everybody's going to start to see some cash. And it may not come across as quickly as they want. You never know how well a film will do. But I think that's been a pretty cool approach to get people invested in me you know invested in or the prop the film the product that we're eventually going to deliver so um there they go so um but yeah i mean i think um it's it's uh it's 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 definitely tough sometimes though because i think people have such a jaded perspective of what film it filmmaking is once they've been inside for a while it's not easy you know there's oftentimes not much money, um, and and so you you've got to find ways to to really get people to believe in you. And and I found that by making multiple films and just sticking with this course of action and not trying to be too elaborate, not trying to aim too high, and you know keeping budgets low enough and everything, that uh, people people respect that and they see that you know it can actually eventually turn a profit, um, which I'd say most of my films are doing now. You know. Um, 
when you when you factor in sweat, it's hard to say exactly how profitable they are. But ultimately, I mean, the films are paying back all the all the costs and getting to that point where you can distribute. You know, um, people share to them, and and t it it's, tends to keep the the people that I've worked with that I really respect. You know, coming back and helping me again. You know, and and there's a few key players for sure that you'll need when you make films like making sure you find somebody who can do great music, you know, that's always such a huge part of story, whether you're creating it from making an original music or, or sourcing, you know, music that's already made out there. That's been really important. And I'm, you know, fortunate enough recently to have found a guy that I really like who I can just go back to and be like, hey, I need this. And he trusts me and knows that, like, I can't necessarily pay him sometimes. Like, when I'm in that moment of, like, I got to get this film done and packaged and out, but eventually that, that paycheck will come. Hunter, how has financing for your five films evolved from the first one to now? Okay. For, so for my first film, 10 Miles Per Hour, we financed it in large part with credit cards. Uh, both Josh and I said, we can't find any sponsors, we don't know where the money's at. Um, put a lot of work into that, put a lot of energy into trying to get you know, other people to help fund the film and, and really blinked out. So we just took our credit cards and financed it and we got to a point in the process where we needed to tap into a little, a little bit of our retirement savings, which was nice that I had that available because I know you know some people don't and, and it's interesting because people are always so afraid to spend their retirement, but I found it really a freeing activity. Like ultimately it's been a great way to use that investment to ultimately further my life and my experiences, which I think should be the right thing. So that was 10 miles prior. We, it was tough. We took a lot of our own you know, money and just dumped it in and said, we've got to get this thing done and we've got to make it and, and, uh, and put it out to the market. Um, eventually, over the course of time with 10 miles per hour, the money that we did, the hard cash that we actually spent on our, our uh, credit cards and retirement was, was returned to us. So that was, that was cool. All the sweat, I'd say, probably never totally got paid back. Um, but it's nice to know that the film is still generating some revenue almost, you know, um, eight years or so after its release. So it's pretty cool. Second film, 10 Yards. Um, we were actually, at this point in time, able to start looking at um, some sponsorships and we were able to close some sponsorships, but it was pretty limited. I mean, we were talking 15 to $20,000, somewhere in that range of cash that we raised but it took quite a bit of edge off with making the film. Um, by this time, I, we had some of the camera equipment already. You know, we'd invested some of that early money in, into sort of building a program. Uh, there was also some additional cash that was put in as sort of an investment from, from an individual. And so that was, again, we were in a place where all of a sudden there was a little bit of money, but we didn't quite have enough money to really round it out, get the film done, and then have enough left over for a launch. Um, so. We were, you know, burning all of the cash on production, which is probably the biggest challenge I think filmmakers face is we get a little bit of money some, somehow or another, you know, and we blow it all to make this film. And then you're in this situation where, okay, well, the film's made, a lot of times people blow it all before they edit it, you know, and then that's a really difficult position to be in. So I think, you know, you really got to think that through and divvy it up and let people know early off that it's going to be a long time before they probably see money. So with 10 yards, Unfortunately, because we were putting all of, all of the money that we, we received from these sponsorships and this individual, we were putting it all into you know, making the film and, and trying to market the film. We ended up spending more money of our own and getting a little bit further into debt. So after that film, I was in a, I was in a tough place. Couldn't figure out how to make any money off that film. It, just, it was just my sophomore slump and it was a really tough one. So go moving on to my third film, um, Ride the Divide. I, you know, I'm figuring things out. I'm realizing, okay, sponsorships, man. I know I can make these work better by this time. I had two examples, and I could sort of paint 10 yards as a success to the sponsors when we went out to try to get money. So I worked with Mike Dion on this, and we went out and we actually raised quite a bit of sponsorship money, I'd say. Um, I want to say around 50 grand, and then there was, again, private investment put into that film, um, probably equal amount in, in private investment. So we actually had a nice chunk of money um, that was put in that film. As we got closer to release, there was another little bit of investment that came in to finish it up. 
Um, and so that film was great because it was in, we were in a situation where there was, there was always cash, but we were very smart about not overspending cash. And we really, most of that money is going into production, not really paying people. It's going into travel. It's going into you know, the aspects of post-production where you really need to hire expertise like sound and color correction. Um, and just finishing the film and getting it really solid, you know, being able to buy product and things like that so you can sell the film. So we had a great situation where when that film was done, there wasn't too much of that, you know, money to pay back. There was a little bit, I think there was a little bit of debt still, debt slash investment that was put into that film. Um, and so we were able to pay that off quickly because the film was, was really successful and had, you know, was by far my, my most, uh, most most profitable film so far that I've worked on and uh, it's you know it continues to do really well and that that film released three or four years ago I think about three three and a half um, and it's still doing really well so it's pretty cool because it's like we passed that mark now it, it creates a revenue stream that I try to figure out ways not to use but um, you know in, in, inevitably I, I I do at times to, to make sure I further this further my career I keep reinvesting in my films so moving on to the fourth film uh, that was where the Yellowstone goes, which was made in tandem with another film called Reveal the Path. And I have some ownership in each of those films, so we can kind of talk about both of those together. Essentially, where the Yellowstone goes was able to raise about seventy-five thousand in sponsorship money. This is coming from um, basically corporate brands uh, or not or nonprofit one nonprofit for for corporate brands and they put money into the film because they liked the message that's that told we found ways to create some ancillary content and just kind of help you know use the film to drive at some of the messages they're trying to communicate and reach the same audience um, then we were also able to raise some crowdfunding money around the time that film was finished and ready for market which helped it go to market we took all the money we raised in crowdfunding and put it into pushing the film further out there and getting more screenings set up um, which is scary to do because you're like you work so hard and you're like oh all of a sudden we got thirty two thousand dollars in the bank and you're like this is great it's payday but but we look at it and we're like it's not you just it's almost like you keep putting this money in there one way or another um, and so that film's done also done really well and it was nice that the minute it went to market for the most part I mean it took a there's a little bit maybe to pay off for like a month or two but like it was like basically instant instant money that we were able to give back to the the partners and the creators. Um, at the same time, we made Reveal the Path, which got um, it got more investment than sponsorship. It got a little bit of sponsorship, not as much as where the Yellowstone goes. I can't say the exact figure, but you know, it's less than seventy-five thousand. And but it got also quite a bit of infusion of investment. It was a highly intensive, like travel around the world film where we went to five different countries and shot. And so we we're dealing with uh, a more expensive film than Where the Yellowstone Goes. And so in the end, that film went to market and had a lot of money to pay back. And we're still at a point where we're paying that film back. So that's just kind of an example of how you gotta weigh all these things and be careful if you can, if you can raise some money and really be careful about how you spend that money. Um, and then you know, try to get partners, creator, cre creative partners on board who will benefit later, uh, you can get to that, that money coming in quicker. Um, and then finally, Walter, um, Walter was is a very low budget film, um, a lot of sweat for both my wife and I. It was, it was kind of a collaborative project where we came together as we were getting married and made this film. Um, and so we had some investment, um, about $35,000 in investment to make the film. We used that cash and then raised 25000 for its release um, and put a lot of sweat and got some, some friends to help us out. So we've got our, again, our creative partner strategy. And uh, we're now uh, releasing it with not too much debt. We, we have some investment, but that's part of the, it kind of balances out with the creative partners as well. So, I mean, we hope that by next year, or you know, early next year, depending on how fast we push the release, because we've, we've been thinking about kind of taking time, but we hope that film is paying everybody back, you know, soon. So it seems to be working, you know, but it's, and, and keep in mind that, that Walter actually started before Where the Yellowstone Goes, so it kind of kind of fits in there. And, and ultimately, Where the Yellowstone Goes let, has led to a, another film, a whole river series. And one of the sponsors that was involved with that 
um, doubled their commitment to the next film and intends to do a, a series of more River films with us. So we're doing sort of the same sort of strategy where we keep a documentary that is essentially low cash budget, high sweat budget, and in the end has a, uh, has a quicker payout for the people that are involved, that are committed and take the chance. So from your years of approaching corporate sponsors, what would you tell someone? What's the first step? What do they want to see? What should you not say? So corporate sponsorship is a tough one because if you've never made a film before, you haven't done anything to sort of prove your potential, you can't just convince a corporate sponsor, a brand, you know, or a nonprofit or somebody like that to give you a bunch of money. They're, they're being approached all the time for all of these different you know, opportunities. But with that being said, you gotta realize they, they're trying to do many of the things that we're trying to do with our, our films, which is reach people. And they need, to, they need to figure out how to create messages and have stories that really, um, that really kind of drive at what their brand is. Um, and so I found you know, if you have a film that has you know, some, some definition of, of sort of a story or a brand or, or kind of a strong niche, you can often find ways to get um, some additional cash or, or assistance. Um, I think that it's important, you know, if you're going at it the first time, you don't have a body of work, to find somebody that does, to find a way to build up your team and, the, and your, your documentary so, or your film that you're making so that you can find a way to say, hey, let's get this, this, uh, this company involved. Um, and they'll take us more seriously. It's pretty easy to attach a name of a producer or you know, or a director or, or an actor or somebody um, like this business is, is all about that. Unfortunately, you need that sort of expertise on something. So it's gotten easier for me as I went because I've had multiple films and I can set them down right in front of them. That being said, I also think you've got to have a story for your own story that you're trying to tell. And that story needs to match with that company's sort of approach, you know, needs to fit in or it needs to surprise them and excite them and make them go, oh, okay, that's, that's the way it is. Um, it's changing so fast. Like when I first went out, it was, it was easy to kind of show like, oh, this online video world was just coming on and I could kind of give them a sense of how we'll be able to, you know, maybe create some additional content um, and maybe, you know, tie their brand into some of the, you know, the DVD extras, but also some of the online extras, you know, there were certain ways that I could give their brand some presence and, and ultimately, you know, make them feel like it was a worthwhile investment and they get that return. Um, I'm finding, you know, even the partners that I've worked with now are coming back to me and going, well, this is really cool what you guys are doing and your films are really getting out there and they're all over Netflix and all these people, you know, but they're still trying to figure out, they're always trying to figure out how to quantify if it is, a good, if they're making good investments in marketing out there. It's such one of those ambiguous areas that's always hard to tell. So I think the more data you can offer when you go out to pitch to brands or, 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 um, or nonprofits, the better. But you also have to kind of have a plan of like, how is this going to really help, um, you know, help an entity that is trying to serve its people. How are you going to help them ultimately reach, reach their goals with what you're trying to put out there? And there's a lot of ways. I mean, when you when you look around, um, I'd say definitely have a nice little presentation. Not very. You don't have to make it very long, but um, at least a sheet or two that really kind of looks good, spells out, you know, how um, how this film is going to help the the brand have some reach. And it's not just about like product placement or you know. Uh, putting a logo on a website or a logo on a box. I mean, there's so many ways now that the brands are, you know, and nonprofits are trying to sort of work with true, authentic stories to ultimately better what they're they're trying to do and their cause. So, I've I've personally made it a point to try to work with brands that I like, you know, um, and and uh, that kind of relate to to the, the nature of my films. I, I like to inspire people to live fuller lives. Um, so for me, I, I focused on trying to, trying to look for companies that are similar and I can tell my own personal story when I sit down in, a, in an office and talk to somebody. So, um, so I think that's important is to kind of just think about that, um, that approach as you go out there um, is, is find brands that are like you, find nonprofits that are like you, that are like your film and, and start from there. You know, like these, there are people that work for these brands and represent, represent these brands are just like us. And, and I think if you can kind of go in and build a relationship, 
they'll be more interested in supporting um, your 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 film, your idea, your story, um, and that takes time. Like people, you can just like making a film. You can't just go and make a film. You can't just go throw one film out there. You really have to say, okay, I'm going to start to get to know these companies, and you know, you know, you can't just like write them and say, hi, I've got this film, and I need you know twenty thousand dollars, or fifty thousand dollars, or whatever. You've got to really, you know, try to get an, an introduction through the right person. If you can't, you know, if you can't, you can use LinkedIn and various other ways to try to find the right people who work for a company in marketing or PR, and uh, really just try to present your case. This is I've got something that's really, really compelling here, and I've got the newfangled way to do it, and I'm connected to these people, and here's how you know how we're going to do it. I wouldn't go too fast into that sale, but ultimately, when you sit down with them, you've got to convince them that, you know, you've got uh, you've got something that's going to do a lot um, for them. And, and this is a great time for that still because I think that there's so much content out there and brands are trying to figure out how to separate themselves a little bit, um, be, be unique and work with the, the true creators, you know, not just the advertising agencies. Ultimately though, adver advertise the ag advertising agencies have a lot of control over this stuff, creative agencies as well. Um, so that's difficult when you start dealing with big brands. They're ultimately going to go to who they trust. Um, and so you might have to take a different approach. Um, it's one area that I've just kind of avoided, you know, I just, I've just figured I could put a lot of energy into that and a lot of us do, but you just, you get, you get beat down. So I kind of, you know, that's, a, that's one of those limitations. Maybe I'm setting it too much for myself, but I won't go too much after the big Nikes or the big Coca-Colas or the big, big brands. I, I usually focus on these smaller kind of mid tier, you know, small, small companies or mid-sized companies that, um, that, that might, uh, might be more apt to listen to me. So let's suppose it's just a cold call that mm -hmm. you're going to make. Maybe you don't have a relationship. Maybe you're not gone LinkedIn with them. Mm -hmm. Would you actually pick up the phone and call them? Would you send them an email? What would be your approach? How long is your message to them? Yeah, generally when I'm first approaching a brand, um, or, a, or some kind of a partner, you know, because there's many other types of, uh, um, Companies, nonprofits, even individuals sometimes um, that uh, that can that can help a film and give uh, you know give some money to it. But um, um, I usually start with email. I usually look online, try to get to know them. Um, I might start with a, a quick email, just you know, saying I'd lo love to talk with you. Um, I've got a pro uh, an idea, a film, or something that I'm working on and, and in development with, and I try not to make it too lengthy, you know, two or three sentences, because everybody's jamming hard and they get into stuff, and when they get this long spiel and pitch, it's like they don't even want to look at it. They just want to move on to their next email or their other thing they got to do. It just it just feels like a lot of work when you see a lot of words on a page. So um, I try I start short, and a lot of times you got to follow up and follow up, and I'll make a phone call. Um, you know, every once in a while I do call like a main, a main phone number at, uh, you know, at a, at a company. I was actually thinking about approaching Smuckers for Walter because they sponsor the 100-year-old um, 100, 100 birthdays with Willard Scott on, on the Today Show. And so I was like, well, I was trying to figure out how to put this together. And, you know, truthfully, I just didn't find the time yet to do that. But, um, you know, my approach there would have been um, I can call Smuckers and and see who would be best to talk to in their PR department or their marketing department. Once you give them an idea, they'll often give you an email or, you know, patch you through to somebody and you can leave them a quick message. You know, and then it's just a matter of starting to have conversations and usually they'll want to see a, a deck or a proposal, like a proposal, you know, a short proposal with some bullet points. Um, and I wouldn't spend too much time like, you know, you know, stressing over that stuff. Like definitely get some, some ideas put together and, you know, have some good, verbiage and you know you know kind of spend some time tweaking and see what works and doesn't work but um, over time you can you'll find that some of these people will be honest with you and you'll get a sense of what they want or what they don't want um, and and hopefully you can get to the point where you're closing some money you know I mean there's you're always going to get so many things like oh we've already spent all our budget or um, no this just doesn't really line up with our strategy this year you know we're really focused on this thing or that thing you know um, and I find that those are, you know, usually quick ways to get rid of you, but at the same time, they're probably true, you know? If you hear that, you go, okay, well, if they're saying that, what, what can I der derive from that? Maybe there's, maybe there's some insight or some clue. Um, and then, of course, you can start to look around for people that know somebody, because a lot of times when you get somebody who 
know someone, you're going to get much further, much faster if you're introduced or if you're even able just to say, hey, I was talking with Nancy, who happens to be your good friend the other day, and Nancy said I should you know, talk with you about this and that she's really excited about this project I'm working on. Maybe, maybe you might be too. Well, instantly there's like, they're so much more receptive. So it's just kind of trying to find that little, that little game to get them to care and to spend some time. And then ultimately once you're in, like they've got to just believe in you. You got to be real. You know, you can't, um, you can't be too fake and they're used to sniffing out lots of fake proposals that aren't going to, aren't going to really go anywhere. So, um, it's a bit of energy, definitely block off some time to, to really go for it and don't get don't give up because it will take time it's you're going to make a lot of calls and put out a lot of emails before you start to see any checks written at what point though should someone move on to the next sponsor i mean if you've left numerous messages do you still take that as a maybe in your mind no i move on i, pro I probably give up too soon too many times uh i I definitely, you know, it's one of those things, uh, we're in the process of raising money right now for a film called Coming Clean, and we have the initial money in, and, and that's closed, and that's been great, but we have a lot of different sort of possibilities, but they're all just sort of lingering, so it's getting easier now to at least get people not to just, like, to, to listen to a pitch, you know, and then they're sort of like hanging in there, like, oh, this sounds good. We've got a number of sponsors that are hanging in the sort of wings waiting they haven't committed but they're interested and we're finding that it's easier to get these sponsors to to listen to our initial pitch and and so I find like with that though it's like you know I'll follow up to a certain point but then I just have to keep going on and I realize that maybe if they're not committing anything that they're not they're not interested but so much of this is about educating them like when you're starting to talk to smaller companies uh, that aren't that don't have whole departments that deal with these types of proposals. You really have to be able to get it, and, and that's why you can get somewhere if you spend the time to educate them and help them realize that, you know, these films are reaching their audience. These fil these films or these projects, a lot of times it's not just a film, it's a multimedia experience, transmedia, you know, different, you know, w you know, level of content that's ultimately going to, you know, hit their audience in the way that they can't hit them by just throwing ads all over the place you know that's what a lot of these places are trying to do you know they're really trying to tr and they're also trying to develop new audience so I think if you can kind of figure out what we're doing and match it to you know where some of the money's at you can ultimately make make uh, make make it go far you know and it's one of those areas that like I don't spend too much time in just because if you get I think if you get too much corporate money or nonprofit money, it does tend to put a damper on your creative space, you know. Um, I definitely have felt that pressure from sponsors where I've, I've gotten money and, you know, I do the best that I can to serve them, but ultimately I'm going to focus primarily on making sure that the, the, the main feature comes together and is solid. And I've seen many of sponsors get worried and watch it happen and they're like, uh, okay, this is my investment and where's this or that? And in the end, they're happy, of course, if the film does well, but also in the end, they don't really know. A lot of times they're just moving on to their next priorities and they don't even care. And they're just, it's, it's a weird process because that, you know, that you would think that they'd want to put more into helping the film do well, but they're, they're done. Once they give you some money, they move on. And, and that's not always a bad thing either, but you, you kind of hope that you find sponsors or partners that are also going to help push that film out into the world. And that's beautiful when you have that, you know, this is sort of this double advantage of like cash coming in that you don't have to pay back. You pay back in different ways because usually there's content or, or something that you give up for it. But, um, but then at the end, they're also going to their huge database of people that potentially are like-minded and helping spread the film out there for you. Hunter, while working on Walter, what was the worst moment and what was that one time when you pretty much thought you were going to be just done pull the plug on it so with Walter I knew that I'd ultimately finish the film in some capacity but um, I think that for me the hardest part of the filmmaking process now is getting to that point where you're letting it go and getting it out there and not because I have to let it go and that's really difficult because I don't know what people are going to think and this and that. I mean, that's a little bit, you know, of course people are going to judge you, but like I'm dealing with the same old, old industry out there and I still give it so much power. Like all of these people that try to shape things and 
try to say this is the way you should do it and you have to you have to do these windows and all this crap it's garbage it's like you know in this day and age we can do whatever we want and we should be doing that and and the times that I do that I do very well um, but with Walter um, you know I'm like okay I'm gonna go through the traditional tra traditional film festival channel again and try to get this into Sundance for the umpteenth time and it's like and I, you know and this time I'm gonna spend you know spend a little extra time and energy and try to get in touch with a few of the, the key stake like the key programmers there the people that might that might care you know and and uh, you go through that and you realize well it's not that they don't care about us you know they just have they have there's so much out there and there's so much money and there's so many places all around the world that are pr trying to produce content and trying to buy for that attention that you start to realize just how crowded this market is and how how difficult that is but that gets me frustrated because I feel like I've paid my dues, you know, and I think so many of us get there. It's like, God, we've, you know, we've paid our dues. We've done this. Why can't I catch a break? So for Walter, the hardest moment for me was like when we got our rough cut done and we started thinking, wow, this is a really cool film that everybody should care about, even though we did it in a low grade way. It's just, it's so important. We're all humans. We're all going to grow old and die very soon before we know it. And it goes fast. And we're all, you know, you get to, a chance to talk to these people from way back when that were born in the 1800s and it's like it's just something was so special to me but that's how we all feel we get so we get so invested personally in our own things so um so when you start to go out and you you go hey sundance hey south by what do you think of this film and then they just deject you you know it's like hmm, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough moment to to have happen over and over again but the best part is, and I've done it every time, I turn right around and I go out there and I make, I make my things count. And I continue to have a career and I have people reaching out to me that love my, my work now enough that they you know, potentially want to bring me in as a creator on a, on a, you know, on a television series or as, a, you know, as somebody who's going to help lead another documentary or that they're going to you know, put some of their company's money into a project that I do because it gets out there. And more importantly, it's like you look at Netflix and there's... 45,000 ratings on a film, you know, or, or more. And you go, God, like all these people are watching this and like taking the time to, to put these, you know, put these stars and, you know, give you, give you feedback and, and sometimes write you like notes and say, Hey, this is awesome. Keep at it. So what I realize is that's who matters. That's what, that's what it's all about. It has, it, we should not, we should not be so focused on this old school industry that's built up. That's making so many people frustrated, you know? So that's pretty much it. Keep after it. Hunter, when you were planning your crowdfunding campaign for Walter, um, did you think that you would end up with the 461 backers that you did? I have to say, when I set out to do the Kickstarter with Sarah, we were, we were nervous about it. We felt like we had a good shot at being successful, but we also knew from the first, my first experience with it that it's so much work. And if you want to be successful, you've got to really stay on it and be on it. And I was a little nervous because I knew this topic that we were dealing with was not cycling and not fishing and not something that really closely matched one of the previous films. In, in essence, it's similar. It's got some of the same themes and concepts of living life well and, and live, live a, a full, happy life, you know. But we set out and we said we're going to go for it and, and we always tell ourselves we're just going to make sure it's successful. We're going to do everything we can not to fail. And, and we were lucky on this one because it just started to hit fast and hit right. Um, one of the things that happened for us where we really got lucky, and I think this comes with having a nice shaped pitch for, um, for, your, for your story, is that uh, Kickstarter recognized it as a, a, a project of the day pretty early in the process. And we actually saw that generating quite a bit of uh, attention from people we didn't know. So that gave us a lot of internal enthusiasm and really kind of gave us that feeling like wow people are gonna like this film you know like that's a good thing so it gave us you kind of need that energy um, we definitely found as usual you need to hit your own friends many many times and I'm not saying like what happens is Facebook sort of hides it from everybody so you have to like trick the algorithms you have to keep keep posting and eventually it does reach people towards the very end of the campaign people are like wow I didn't hear anything about this I want you know like they were surprised and I was like how did, how did people not hear about this I'm sitting there like paranoid I'm PBS styling it like crazy like just pitching 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 and I'm like people are going to defriend me but you have to kind of do that and not worry about it and go hey this is what we do 
like we make these films and there's not a lot of support for them in the United States especially and you know the only way that we're going to truly get this thing out there and finish up this process is if the friends and fans that we've had before come come back and support us again and and fortunately you know they did a lot of a lot of the 461 were people that have found us along the way on different film projects and it's really kind of neat because I'll see somebody pop on I'll be like who gives a little bit of money and I'm like ah oh, that's a guy that first started talking to me during 10 miles per hour and I always you know I try my hardest to try to stay connected um, online wherever with people that are really reaching out to me you know I, I, I don't see why we shouldn't be um, so it's kind of neat to see that sort of process happen, but it takes a ton of work. You know, it's a combination of email. If you have an email database, you definitely got to be emailing and usually that's really effective. Social media, the times it works, times it doesn't. You know, you got to, I spent a little bit of money with Facebook boosting some of my posts. You know, I'm not afraid to do that. I know that I don't, you know, appreciate the way that I sometimes feel like you get blocked out unless you spend money. Um, but you got it. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount of money for what I think the return was. You know, Twitter, it's it's one of those hit and miss things. You got to, you know, just keep peppering it out there. And, and then, I, you know, I find like posting images, there's certain tricks of the social media and you can look all those up to kind of try to get social media like impressions a little higher. Um, and that's important. It's amazing how the, the sort of dorky things like share this, you put, you put share this on a image or something like that, maybe a little quote from Walter and it just starts to go, you know, like so many people share it. And I mean, I shouldn't discredit that. I appreciate people doing that, but it's like, it's funny because to me it feels sort of hokey and in, insincere, not authentic. And you would, you know, sometimes wish those more authentic things would go. But, um, but ultimately we were really happy. We hit that 461 and I remember we were looking at each other as it went on and we're like, Man, what if we get to 400? That'd be so cool. I think we had 372 backers with Yellowstone. So for us, as we got past that 372 mark, it was less about the money. It was more about the backers. We were like, this is cool. Like more and more people are taking a few minutes to like really buy into and many times, not just a few minutes, but you know, several, like quite a bit of money too, you know, to really buy into this project and help support it and see it, see it play itself out. So it's pretty cool. And, it, and one of the things you do, you know, in, in crowdfunding is you're kind of looking at your peers, you're looking at other films out there you're kind of, I like to analyze a lot try to figure out like okay is this real money like are they are they jacking it up somehow and that was always a goal of ours with this campaign we're like we do not want to have to find a friend to top it off at the end and get us to that hump or you know and whatnot and so it was it was pretty cool when we were able to just sit back and and trust the process to work and and work very hard to help it work and uh and and heave a huge sigh of relief when we could stop badgering everybody and take our PBS campaign off the airwaves and just let it be, you know, so. What happened when you hit, and I love this, to the sophomore slump, because I mean, yeah. every campaign, it seems like they take off like a rocket, some mm -hmm. of them at least, and then you hit that lull. So what, what were you doing during that time? What were you and Sarah up to? So we hit our sort of midterm lull, soft, sophomore slump, probably about 10, 15 days into the campaign, and it was like, up to that point, it was, we were averaging over a thousand a day. I mean, or something like that. I mean, we were at like 15, 16,000 when we hit that low. And we're like, we're so close. It's like 4,000, but then you're like $4,000, that's a lot of money. Like you start seeing, you know, $20 here and then you don't get a donation till, you know, that night and it's, you know, $7. And we're like, God, we're like at this rate, we're not gonna get there all of a sudden. So it's like, we really felt the impact of that low. By that time, the, the, the energy that Kickstarter helped bring into the into the experience had gone away you know it's amazing online if you're top shelf on a film like when when Netflix moves us out to top shelf and features one of our titles there's a lot of people that see that movie over a short period of time we get emails we see sales go up same thing with Kickstarter when you're top shelf on Kickstarter on these digital platforms it's like that's the name of the game how do you get top sh top shelf you know but you see that happen, it's like, it's awesome. But then when you're on your own, you, you know, you feel it. And of course it hit our, our little lull. And I think our friends and family, everybody like, we're, we're looking at us going, yeah, these guys are gonna hit their, their $20,000 goal. And then, it, so it took, we, we tried to like, put it out of our mind and not put as much energy into it, but you still can't help it. You're like, oh, maybe I should be pushing more. And of course your dreams are starting to fade of going above your 20, you know, your goal and you're like, Oh, you know, you start doing the math and you're like, we really need a lot more to do what we tell everybody we're doing here. We're trying to launch an, an Academy qualifying film bid, which means we've got to, you know, get New York, a, a full week in New York, a full week in LA and spend all this money. And it's just like, it starts mounting in your mind. 
So eventually, you know, we did take a few days off and then, and then we just kind of found a way to finish strong and we launched a, um, you know, the big thing is uh, doing sort of a stretch goal now, but we didn't do one stretch goal. We did these small mini stretch goals and we actually announced new theatrical locations that we'd be able to play if we hit those goals. So like 21,000 was um, Great Falls and which is Walter's hometown and then 22,000 was Seattle and Portland or something like that. So we were able to like kind of start to build out our, our launch presence beyond Los Angeles and New York with these mini goals. And we were able to get all the goals done except for the last one. We had one last one which was $5,000 to do a little UK, Europe you know, uh, tour, but we knew that one was a, a real stretch. So we were totally happy with how it turned out. And, and uh, it was, you know, I'm just thankful that, that we got it done. So we understand that you want to qualify Walter for the Oscars, and there's a very set process. Mm -hmm. Is that right? What, what is that process, and what are you doing? So we had a chance with Walter when we were getting ready to release it. We were like, well, what, what would it take to? qualify for an Academy Award. You know, how do they decide who wins an Academy? There's got to be something you go through. So we just went online and, and looked at their website. Um, and they have a very extensive list of rules for various types. If you've got a narrative feature, or if you've got, a, in our case, a documentary feature, the rules are different from what you'd need for a documentary short, or a short narrative, or a foreign film. And so um, we started to read through them. And I was, as I was reading them, I'm like, well, it's not as difficult as you might think. Um, I know that they're, they're making it, you know, uh, be something that they don't, don't want just any film, like any, you know, low-grade film that's made kind of cast out to. But they, so they, they do qualify some things that cost some money. Um, and essentially, these rules sort of change from time to time. But at the current moment for a documentary feature, um, you have to screen commercially for a week in New York and Los Angeles. And these are minimum requirements, so they're definitely looking for you to do more as much as possible with film. So um, when, you, when we talk about New York, they're talking about Manhattan Borough. So you gotta be in the big city with you know, all the other films that come out every week. There's something like 20 plus films that are launched every week in, in New York. And you've gotta have reviews in New York and also reviews on the West Coast in, in proper uh, newspapers like the New York Times. Um, which becomes uh, fairly easy to do if you have a commercial release in, in New York, because as of right now, it's the New York Times policy to review films that are released for a week there. Um, I have, over the years, tried to get New York Times and various like bigger periodicals to review my films, and they don't uh, because of this particular you know factor. They have so many films releasing there, and they, they basically review only what's re released commercially. So in addition to releasing commercially on a, on a documentary, you have to send the Academy 250 DVDs. And they, those go out to their nomination committees who decide, uh, who's, who decide ultimately what's going to be nominated. Um, and those DVDs cannot have any artwork on them as we found the hard way. We actually had a DVD that was designed with a for your consideration cover on it and it's only textured which we didn't consider art, but it was art. Um, ultimately, it was not just blank or, or uh, you know, not, not art. And so, um, fortunately, they're, they're, they've been very considerate and they're working with us, you know, at each of the stages here. And so we have a, a, a quick solution of sending some envelopes that they'll stuff um, for us. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see all of these little pieces and parts. You also have to advertise in New York and LA. Um, a minute, very minimal requirements there, but you do have to have at least one ad in um, a couple of newspapers um, before your premieres. And you have to have a certain amount of screenings and they have to be between a certain period of time. Um, those are the basic requirements to be able to qualify a film for the, for the academy. And of course you send in some paperwork and sign, sign some stuff. No money is required in order to qualify other than making your commitment to get your film out commercially. And that's definitely like, for most production companies um, is, is you know, a huge undertaking and costs quite a bit. Um, I should say too that you have, cannot have screened your film anywhere before it goes into a theater and has its, you know, its release. I believe, it can, it can, I believe it can have screened at like film festivals, but it can't, um, you know, it has to have its, its world premiere. It can't be commercially available, you know, as a, 
as a digital download or as a DVD before you go into theaters. And have you looked at prior, like I'm thinking of Innocente, I think was, was that last year's? Or yeah, it was, I just saw the trailer and it looked amazing. Yeah. Um, but have you looked at some of the other success stories with that and tried to kind of see what they've done? Or I, I don't yeah. know, I'm just wondering what kind of background research do you do before you make such a time commitment and mm -hmm. money, I'm sure too. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a shoot from the hip guy a lot of times. I just get a hunch and I go with it. And so in this particular instance, I didn't really do a ton of research. You know, I definitely saw other campaigns. I read about campaigns that felt like it wasn't worth the costs to nominate or to allow a film to be, to be considered for nomination uh, to qualify. Um, I, I, we actually looked at it as it was part of our Kickstarter campaign. We wanted people to be able to help us give us that opportunity because besides the, the opportunity to be qualified, it was the opportunity to play in New York. I've never played for a week in New York, never played for a week in LA, you know, gotten the open in, in sort of a commercial theater in this manner. A lot of times my films are going on theatrical tours. Um, sometimes I'm with them. We're playing in all kinds of different places. Lots of theaters. I've definitely spent money in, in like uh, outdoor towns um, at big theaters like the Boulder Theater, which is very expensive to rent for one night, you know, to launch a film. But um, but I've never had this sort of traditional film release, and I felt after ten years, I felt personally I deserved it. And so I, I it was one of those moments where I said, I'm going to do it, and I want to get this film out there. It's a film that I don't think has a lot of chances of getting a nomination personally just based on what I've seen out there that's been nominated but I think it's a terribly important film um, you know I, I got a chance to spend time with these people that are incredible and I think if people see the film for what it's supposed to be you know if they really get it they'll see the way that we um, have sort of captured their lives and in, in kind of context to uh, you know Sarah and my life as we come together and I think uh, you know, I think that there's so many people that sort of miss the things that matter in life. And I try to, like in my films, I try to put that out there. And so when I, when I think about what we tried to do, and I don't know if we achieved it yet because we haven't seen how it plays out, you know, um, it's something that personally I feel like, why not? Why, why, can't they, why can't this potentially be recognized by the Academy? You know, who judges what, what an Acad you know, Academy uh, nominated film should be? So we figured we'd give it a shot and we can never look back and say we didn't. And now we know the process and it's not that scary, but it's expensive. I mean, I, I guess you're gonna sink, if you go for the very minimum, which I think that they prefer you to do more than a very minimum, I mean, you're gonna sink probably $25,000 at least into it, which is you know where we hit with Kickstarter, interestingly enough. But um, if you want to really support your launch and you're gonna open commercially in New York and LA and, and potentially other theaters, I mean, you really wanna probably be thinking like 50 to $75,000, you know, depending on who you need to hire or how much you can or can't handle. Um, publicists, for example, they're not cheap. Um, and we try to do a lot of our own publicity in different ways. Uh, but, you know, for this release of Walter, we went ahead and, and hired a publicist. And I started calling around and trying to get publicists to consider the film. And, and it was difficult. You know, there was a lot of that New York based publicists um, that you hear about and you meet when you go to places like conferences like South by Southwest. And they won't even consider, you know, your your films because they've never heard of you or you're too small or, or whatnot. Um, but but those that do, like, I mean, they'll 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 quote you like four thousand or five thousand for a release in New York, and then you know a few more thousand dollars for release the, the release in L.A. You know, I mean, you're looking at, um, you know, that kind of money for a few weeks of someone's time to ultimately go out and push your film to the press. And it sounds like a lot of money, but if you don't work with those types of people and you work with somebody who's a lot lesser, they don't necessarily have those types of connections to where they can make a phone call to somebody at the New York Times that they sort of know, so they know they can ultimately maybe get you know, some favorable press for your film. That being said, you never know. Like You can spend all that money and get nothing. Um, we decided to go for someone who was in the heart of the documentary world at, uh, in, in New York. She works very closely with Stranger Than Fiction doc series by Tom Powers and Doc NYC Film Festival. And so she really had a lot of connections and kind of helped, helped us build a grassroots game out there. And, and uh, it was just a really great personality, a really wonderful person. And she's worked very hard on the film. Um, and, and, uh, but I don't think she had um, 
has yet quite those really big powerhouse connections, which in a way we kind of liked because that's where we're at. She just matched who we were. We matched. She matched the way we uh, we feel about things. And when you can be okay with that and be at peace with that and not not worry too much that you're not necessarily going to get the you know the hundreds of huge articles or whatever you know you you kind of uh, you kind of let it be. But um, it's it's always a little tough because you're spending quite a bit of money on PR and you don't really know what it's going to do for you. What would you say the bulk of the 25000 that you raised for Walter on Kickstarter was spent on? So the bulk of the, the money raised on Kickstarter uh, was definitely spent on this Academy qualifying campaign and specifically the commercial releases in New York and LA. Uh, there are ways to four-wall commercial release and we are four-walling four our commercial release. So, um, which is tough because you walk into LA, New York uh, in our sp specific case, um, it's going to be a little different depending on if you're getting daytime slots or evening slots. Um, but as of right now, I mean, it's, um, you know, you're looking at probably $12,000 to $20,000, somewhere in that range in order to be able to secure those two locations for one week. and. And you're talking anywhere, I mean, you're talking like 14 to 21 screenings at each location for that kind of money. So if you've got a film that's not going to get a lot of audience, and we know going into it, we're not going to get a ton of audience doing it, you're not going to see much of that money come back. That's just money that poofs away. But that money comes back in interesting ways, and this gets back to the idea of investing for the long term, thinking about the long term. And this is an experiment, so I can't speak for sure about this. But my feeling is by giving the film a little bit of a bigger, richer context from the beginning, um, sort of polishing it up and having it be this type of film that has reviews, whether they're good or not, you know, it's got these reviews, it's got bigger press, and it will ultimately help shape the film for some bigger sales down the road. So I think that money will come back. That's my prediction, and we'll, you know, I'm happy to check back with you guys. But it's pretty scary when you're like, you know, writing these checks, and you go, well, shoot, for, for you know, fifteen thousand dollars, I could put on a heck of a good tour and go to places where we know we could probably fill the theaters and make all that money back and more, and then put that to the film to go forward. But you'll get a bunch of reviews in like small towns like Great Falls, which are great and they always feel really good, but they don't necessarily speak to the film industry and allow you those film you know, the film-based opportunities where people want the film and help sell it further on down the road. So when you were calling these theaters in LA and New York, were you going based on price or were you going based on which ones actually had ends with getting those reviews in the New York Times, LA Times? What was your strategy? So our strategy when we set up our commercial releases in New York and LA was first to kind of research and see if other people had done this, which which they had. So I started to realize there's actually people that will help broker the, the deal for you. Uh, so if you Google around, yeah, you'll find somebody who can kind of help you and it's all part of a package price. Um, I actually went direct to IFC Center and said, hey, because I'd seen in an article, IFC Center helps films qualify for Academy Awards, meaning they will book a, the book a film at a four wall price uh, for, you know, for a week. Um, meaning you don't have to go through this weird convoluted system I still haven't figured out to get a booker to consider your film to get it out there. You know, I'm starting to realize as I do this more and more, it is very controlled by the studios or the distributors that have the money to market these films. So for somebody that's, you know, smaller and has smaller films and doesn't necessarily have a ton of money for P&A, it's going to be very difficult for you to get like conventional theatrical re releases out there. Uh, but there are these smaller art houses that are starting to realize that in New York and LA and, and for, a certain, for a certain kind of price you can get in. So I went to IFC Center first, talked to, um, talked to a guy there about what it would cost and he started to run some numbers and I think it was like around you know 6500 for their lowest package which is day daytime daytime screenings you know you have to be within a certain window to qualify it has to be after one o'clock so it's not like 10 a.m. screenings but it's still like you're talking about like pretty early screenings you could have a, a 115 and a 315 screening for your movie you know and that's your that's your <laughs> theatrical launch you know we were in a situation where we were like, well, we want an evening slot. We want to definitely have that evening feel for the film and have, 
you know, some people that we know in the industry and some of some other people show up and see the film. So we negotiated, we ended up working with a guy in LA that set up both IFC Center and, um, and uh, a theater chain here called Lamley that would, you know, ultimately launch our film um, for, you know, the right kind of times that we liked. So we paid a little, a little extra to get some better times. But I think we're definitely happy to have done that. Just have had that experience, and you know, and uh, and we actually used the Kickstarter experience and brought it back. I mean, we had we had people that that uh, contributed two hundred dollars to be part of our premieres uh, out in in New York that showed up, and we got to meet these new people, and you know, they became I think hopefully deeper fans. You know, they it, it seems that they were happy with the fact that they put money into helping make this possible. But that ultimately kind of helped us feel like we could throw a little bit of party and have a have a fun launch out there in New York. And uh, so that was pretty cool to see that, see that play itself out. So you ultimately did go with a booker mm -hmm. in the end? Yeah. We did, yeah. You did, uh-huh, okay. And they've been, you know, it's been an interesting experience working with, with a booker, you know, and you're kind of trying to figure out the system and, and ha they're talking to you about this or that and, you know, we're dealing with something now where they're trying to switch us out possibly with a different theater here and so that's a little bit that's a little bit of a challenge last minute, you know, seeing, seeing, seeing that happen. Um, and I don't know if the Academy wants it that way. Who knows? You know, that's something I'm curious about. I, I've definitely toyed with the idea of um, how, how transparent like Sarah and I are going to be about here's what our experience was like. I mean, it's definitely been an up and down battle. It's been one of those things where it's like, man, are we, should, should we really be spending the money this way? You know, it's definitely something we think about, but I, I have convinced myself and I do feel like it is nice to have a legitimate release for a film um, and to put the money into that but you know you do there's a point where you have to think about like if you're spending to, you know 15,000 plus all the other expenses for travel and all this other stuff so over $20,000 to do something but you're not really seeing much money come back does that I mean economically it doesn't make any sense in that moment again we'll see down the road with a little bit of smoke and mirrors you never know you know and you know somehow if 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 there was ever a chance that we'd get nominated or even shortlisted it would definitely give us you know some attention um and even if it didn't doesn't happen on this film but maybe it introduces us to the right people and it helps us down the road on another film you know maybe that was that was a gamble that was worth it so that's that's the way i look at it you know i, I kind of look back to the Kickstarter moment, this is what we told people we were gonna do, that's what we, you know, that's what we built our campaign around and, and we wanna see it through, so, wow. chalk, you know, chalk it up to that. And, and in the end, you didn't leave these jobs just to make something and, and just put it up on YouTube in, yeah. the, in the very end. I mean, you you, you want that press, you want yeah. that, those two, even if some of it is smoke and mirrors, which are probably so yeah. many filmmakers it is, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, that's why you took that big leap and that's why she did, so yeah. I, I think that, it's probably hard in the moment to, you know, yeah. it see, is. see those numbers, but then you don't know down the line. It is hard in the moment, but there's, there's that point, there's a, those points in your career where you shouldn't be afraid to make those, and sometimes that's leaving the day job for a while, like we talked about earlier. You know, when I look, look at all these points where I've taken risks, like, I, there's really not any time where I look back and go, darn it, why'd I do that, you know? Sometimes it's hard in the moment, like I feel the difficulty of spending all this money on this launch, but... Um, I realize like it's allowing me to be here. I'm taking as many meetings as I can. I'm you know reconnecting with uh, many filmmakers or many people in the industry that I've known over the years. And so there's other ways where you see the benefit of something for do for taking this this crazy action that's a little scary, you know, a little risky, um, and you never know how it's gonna how it's gonna pan itself out. Right. And sometimes playing it safe can hurt someone. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean. There's many times where I'm timid and, and shy and I play it safe and I'm like, wow, nothing's happening. Wow, hmm, this is, you know, and you can just feel yourself becoming a little less relevant. So then you find ways to, to step it up. And I'm just grateful that I'm at a point where there's a, there is a crowd, there's this idea that people can come together and help collectively, you know, help you take that step, you know, have that confidence. I think if people, you know, continue to approach it that way, but not, you know, you know, not, you know, not abuse that. I mean, it's something I take pretty seriously. If, if, if I'm raising money from fans and friends and family, like I want to do everything I can to come through for them and give them something awesome. And, and I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that probably don't, um, don't do that.